Yes, today. We begin the first keynote address. And we are very, uh, very fortunate to have today, this morning, two uh, very experienced academics in their field. And the keynote address, Shama, will be given by Yang Bagia Professor Emeritus Dr. Zakir Hamid. But Professor Emeritus Dr. Zakir Hamid will be replaced uh, by Professor Dr. Muhammad Hamad Harul. Because, doctor, because Professor Emeritus Dr. Zakir Hamid has another event uh, abroad in overseas. And for the sessions, we will have Yamanagaya Pusidato Gotova Shevante, both of the directors of the University of Science in Malaysia, to be a chairperson for the keynote address. Without further ado, I will talk on Yam Prabhangaya Professor Dato Gotova Shevante as a chairperson, and together with Professor Dr. Muhammad Kalman Harwal, Assistant Vice Chancellor, Mr. Mr. Plantai, come on the stage to begin this keynote address one. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih kepada Ibu Bacara. Tuan Sri Datu, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first session for today. And we have a paper prepared by Professor Emeritus Datu Dr. Zakri Abdul Hamid, who is currently overseas in London. The title of this paper is Transformation and Empowerment of Muslim Scholars in Research, Creativity and Innovation. Uh, the biodata of Dr. Zakri is in our programs. Uh, I just highlight a few. Uh, he was actually, this episode, he was uh, also Deputy Vice Chancellor with UKM when I was also Deputy Vice Chancellor. Student Affairs, looking after 20,000 students and he was on research and development. So then he went to Japan uh, with the United Nations University. One word is missing that he is the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, United Nations University. And he came back, appointed as the science advisor to uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of Malaysia. And at the same time, he's also the chairman, the first chairman of the Council of Professors in Malaysia. With me on stage is uh, Professor Dr. Kam Mama Kamal. Uh, I just had his bio data. Uh, he came from the same university of PhD from UB University of Manchester, Institute of Science and Technology. I was also from there back in 1982. I'm not sure whether he supported United, uh, Manchester United or Manchester City. I just watched. I don't support the winner. Uh, he is currently assistant vice chancellor of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and he the global entrepreneurship research and innovation center at University of Malaysia Kelantan. Was a deputy vice chancellor at the University Technology Mara the 2007 to 10, and dean of the faculty of applied science UITM from 2005 to 2007 and Director of UUIT and Malacca Branch Campus. Dr. Professor uh, Kamal is also the President of the Institute of Materials Malaysia, Chairman of the Malaysian Accredited Certification Body of the Asian Welding Federation, Member of the Industrial Consultative Council, Malaysian Petroleum Resources Corporations, under Pemandu, and currently is also the Class Delegate 
for Industry and Innovation National Council of Professors. So it's very much many hands. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Kama to read to present Prof. Zakri's uh, keynote address. Please. Physician, 
Ibn al-Haytam or al-Hazir was a great Muslim physicist and physician who was a pioneer in the science of optics that went on to become the basis of space and science. The second millennium was also the time of Al-Biruni, perhaps the best astronomer that ever lived. In the meantime, the surgeon Al-Zahrawi was performing wonders in the field of surgery, and I can go on and on. But, there, but where are the Muslim Greeks of our age? We seem incapable of producing them. Yes, we have a few political leaders, but they have not built great nations, much less great civilizations. They are known mainly for the controversies that attract them, and it is unlikely that they will be remembered, as the great Muslim scholars of the past are remembered and revered. The countries that constitute the organization of Islamic cooperation, who I see today, lag behind in the scientific world. As innovators, none of them can be considered in the league of developed nations. Despite the financial wealth, many of them have performed. Part of the problem is a lack of mastery of modern knowledge, in particular science and technology. Majority of OIC countries spend less than 0.5% of their gross national domestic product on research and development. Support for human resources in science is low and apart from Egypt, Turkey and Iran, a critical mass of researchers is absent in many countries. Moreover, apart from Malaysia, most OIC countries hardly export any high technology products. In the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, science report in the year, for the year 2010, it showed that less than half of the OIC's 56 countries have a National Academy of Sciences of their host to a supranational academy. This is astounding. As academies of science, as, as strong advocates of science and the impartial advising bodies have been, at the vanguard of scientific endeavor in countries such as the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, as well as France. They are also part of the landscape in emerging economies such as Brazil, China, India, and Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, on the changing global landscape, science, technology, and innovation are becoming increasingly global, with more scientific activity taking place in more countries cities and institutions that have been At the same time, growing global collaboration is making this activity increasingly interconnected. Continued growth in worldwide research, spending, and the development of easier and faster ways to collaborate means that these trends will set to continue. The big table of science so long dominated by the scientific superpowers such as the USA, Western Europe and Japan are in flux. In the coming years, China, Brazil, India and South Korea are set to assert themselves even further, along with newly emerging scientific nations in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, North and South Africa, and middle ranking industrial countries such as Canada and Australia, as well as some of the smaller nations of the world. At the 1908 Olympic Games in London, China failed even to win the team. Eight years later, in Seoul, it finished in 11th place. In London this year, China climbed to second, just behind the United States. And in 2008, at Beijing, played host to the most spectacular Olympic in history, China topped the table for the first time with a tally of 51 gold, 21 silver, and 28 bronze medals. This sporting success is emblematic of a wider shift in the economic and political order, which has seen a more confident China gradually assume a prominent role on the world stage. But if this is what China can achieve in sport, how quickly will it become a leader in science and technology? In both cases, the Chinese government 
has set ambitious long-term targets and mobilized vast resources to achieve them. Since 1999, China's spending on R&D has increased by almost 50% each year. And it is now the world's second largest R&D investor after the US. In 2006, the Chinese government approved a new 15-year plan for science and technology. Meeting its target will require investment in 2020 to be six times what it was in 2001. These investments are starting to yield impressive results. Since 1981, the number of peer-reviewed papers produced by China has increased 64-fold. If this rate of growth continues, China will become the leading producer of scientific publication by the way. In India, levels of R&D investment are also rising. There is a talent pool of 2.5 million new, new graduates every year in IT, engineering, as well as the natural sciences. In 2008, India's Prime Minister Mohan Singh announced plans for quantum jump in science, education and research. Singh pledged to open five new Indian institutes of science, education and research, eight institutes of technology, seven institutes of management and 30 new universities. One million school pupils will each receive a science scholarship of 5,000 rupees, which is equivalent to US $130 over the next five years, and 10,000 scholarships of 100,000 rupees for a year will do. For a year per year, will go to those taking science degrees. Brazil is now the world's 15th largest producer of scientific population. Up eight places in under area. In November 2007, Brazil's President Lula announced an action plan for science and innovation accompanied by US 20 billion of fresh investment. And its budget is set to rise further in 2009. Brazil's scientific publications are most concentrated in agriculture, biology, and earth sciences, reflecting the importance of the country's natural resources. Even in the Middle East, which has traditionally lagged below global average in science and technology, is showing signs of renewed ambition. Particular impetus is coming from energy from energy rich nations which see science and innovation as a key to, the, to their long term prosperity in the face of oil shortages and climate change. In 2009, Saudi Arabia opened the $10 billion King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, which aims to become an international center for medicine, pharmacology, computer science. And the government of Qatar has built a 2,500-acre education city on the outskirts of Doha and set a target of 2.8% of its GDP to be spent on research and development. And in 2008, the United Arab Emirates launched the Mazda Initiative, which aims to create a sustainable city with homes for 50,000 people and 1,500 business focus on renewable energy and sustainable technologies. The recognition of the role that science can play in driving economic development and in addressing local and global sustainability has led to the increased research activity and application of science within less developed countries. The challenge for Muslim scholars is how to reap the maximum benefit of global science how to ensure that the fruits of this science are best used to address current and global issues and to prepare for opportunities and challenges of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, on the transformation and empowerment of Muslim scholars, with the, with the changing global landscape, Muslim scholars need to come down from their ivory towers to help solve the world's most pressing problems and the global challenges such as climate change, water, population change, loss of biodiversity, food and energy security. All these issues
should require politicians to engage with science globally and locally in order to identify sustainable solutions. There is also an important role for science in addressing concerns such as poverty, alleviation, sustainability, as well as privacy. Science, which is the bread and butter of scientists, is the key to solving many of the challenges for sustainable However, Muslim scholars are more comfortable in their identities. Currently, the Muslim scholars have absconded from their duties of playing an active role in science, policy making and diplomacy. I agree that we as the Muslim scientists and scholars should continue to strive for scientific excellence, but there's another, another role that we are not maximizing, and that's getting our hands dirty in public debate the role of Muslim scholars as public. Most political decisions involve short time spans, while scientists are free of such time-bound mindedness and can help address global problems whose results are likely to take place years of de or decades ago. There is, an, there is an opportunity for scientists to not only get involved in national policy making, but also in international science efforts. Informing foreign policy on global challenges, promoting international science cooperation and research centers, and improving international relations. If you think you are not part of a large international process, think again. All these world conventions are underpinned by science. You must reflect on how you can be part of this process and not just a bystander. What I urge here is more is a more proactive, high-profile role on Muslim scientific community in helping reduce some of the global challenges facing humanity. On related front, in his keynote address at the National Professors Congress on the 6th of June last year, the Honorable Prime Minister urged all the professors and scholars to play a vital role in shaping the right mindset of young Malaysians to help realize the country's future. He stressed that the professors should be agents of change and transformation. It will be of no use to just produce academic persons, but what is needed is to produce truly educated minds for this nation. The young Malaysian researcher must be able to think and research as well. These are challenges to which the academic community must rise to be a part of the mainstream of national development. There are various means by which professors can assist in the success of One Malaysia, the new economic model, the GDP, as well as the PDP. This range from clarifying the steps needed to strengthen national solidarity to pinpointing priority areas in science and innovation. Perpetual effort is required to transform society build on and improve human capital and knowledge assets with education and continuing The role of the academic community in particular, professors in our public and private universities is pivotal for Malaysia to break through economically and sustainably. To be sure, the need of such role has been expressed in the 1950s by academics of the earlier era for example, by the late Cyprusian Alatas. That role has also been manifested in a magnificent, magnificent and single-minded way by Royal Professor Uruazis in his mission to alleviate poverty among the rural population in the 1960s and eventually among his many achievements, the creation of that nation. If two persons could bring about such a change, imagine the potential of a thousand odd the dream of Malaysian academics speaking up to those in power and the public at large. This input could be aimed towards improving government policies and programs such as the Government Transformation Program and the Economic Transformation Program. Another important element is the need for far greater international collaboration to be embedded in the research system and structures in structures of this university institutes as well as private R&D centers. It is about time to include international linkages with one peers in another country as key performance indicators for academic promotion as well as planning. Many 
many Muslim scholars still shy away from meaningful, long-lasting collaboration with potential partners overseas as well as colleagues. Policy intervention may be needed perhaps by making collaborations as a prerequisite of popular research funding. For example, exchange of trainees such as postdoctoral fellows and visiting professors as well as availability of permanent positions for non-native investigators and faculty members need to be acknowledged. Ladies and gentlemen, on the government initiatives and transformation programs, the Malaysian government firmly advocates the belief that knowledge transforms the nation. Knowledge allows for development of the nation both from a social and economical perspective. Firstly, socially, knowledge equips our people with the ability to be humane and to understand others. Malaysia is wonderfully, wonderfully multicultural. We are united by our common values and shared experiences. Such can only be obtained through knowledge and by a form both formal and informal. Ignorance leads to fear and knowledge dispels them. Secondly, economically, knowledge allows us to utilize our nation's resources, to capitalize on our comparative advantages and engage with the free market in a way that is beneficial for all nations. The government has initiated many transformation programs and sculptured various policies in order to be able to capitalize on the knowledge base of the nation as well as to promote the further development of such institutions. At the heart of the transformation programs that has been introduced by the Honorable Prime Minister of the Nation, the transformation of governance, the transformation of the economy and the transformation of society the of the population, people's first performance now and the economy and the new economy model lie two critical elements. Knowledge and values or knowledge guided values. Knowledge alone will not suffice. It can bring good or harm. Knowledge must be twinned with the wind and nourished by good values. In the 10th edition plan, one of its thrusts is to increase the knowledge and innovation base of the nation as well as promote first class mindset. The government has allocated billions of ringgit for the educational sector, including research and development to be invested over the upcoming years to develop and strengthen the knowledge of the digital system. Undoubtedly, many challenges lie ahead. Malaysia needs to work hard at improving the capacity of our knowledge, I said, to transform our society as well as society. Ladies and gentlemen, on the way forward, with that in mind, the National Professors Council testament to the importance of knowledge and cumulative strength that intellect brings to the nation and her people, and how we can act as agents for change as well as transformation. For the benefit of our international participants, the National Professors Council was established in April 2010. The Council currently represents more than 1,700 strong professorial level academic staff in the public as well as private universities in the country. Churchill's forecast almost 70 years ago that a nation's success would depend on the minds of its citizens could not have proven more true. It is a message Muslim scholars must take. Your duties and tasks are by no means a small feat. From conducting research to discover the undiscovered, Devoting the leaders and thinkers of the world, your presence is an asset to Muslim communities worldwide. This conference is a step in that direction. I wish all participants a fruitful and beneficial meeting conference. This will certainly underscore our commitment towards transformation and empowerment of Muslim scholars in research, creativity, and innovation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is the message that I was up to on the way of the symbols and this. I thank you very much for the fact that you mentioned